welcome to the Rabbit Trail Podcast, episode number 89. 89. <laughs> well, I'm not Greg Harris, but I am Stephen Oldham, and I'm the local outreach coordinator here. And today we are going to have some Q&A. And, uh, but unfortunately, our, our guest, our, our major host is not here today. Greg's on vacation. Well, actually, um, you know, Kaylee, you addressed your letter last week to Stephen and I and didn't include <laughs> Greg. He was a little bit miffed said he needed a cooling off period so he's taking this week off so <laughs> so thank you for giving Stephen and i the platform yeah I mean, we, great. Appreciate Thanks, we appreciate it. it yeah so today we're, we're talking about different questions that you guys have sent in but also um if you are following us you can now follow us on youtube uh go ahead and subscribe to the channel there uh, of our church channel you'll get these updates when they pop up and um yeah and give us a thumbs up and rate the podcast and make comments so uh, yeah yeah um, have, put in a question absolutely and so uh my name is brent i'm the connections pastor here at all branch church and uh, uh i just want to remind you guys if you have any questions we would love to hear them we would love to discuss them if you have any feedback we would love to hear that too and you can get a hold of us at rabbit trail at obcc.church rabbit trail at obcc.church um so uh Make sure it's the dot church right yes yes <laughs> so uh so again uh this is kind of a kind of a bonus uh episode i think it's not going to really be a full episode um because greg wanted to discuss the sermon and bring some things out so he asked to wait on that but he found a um, really juicy <coughs> rabbit trail we, he wants to explore these rabbit trails he likes the creativity conversation so that'd be fun yes and and so we did get a question uh and so we thought Ooh. well let's just address this Boy, because for question. one i think it's <laughs> going to be a quite a discussion today i think it'll be fun and uh um, and anything but, we get wrong, you can just wait for next week and ask Greg. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, but but the other side of it was uh, this question has been in the works for a few weeks. And I was just approached by Anna on Sunday and she said, how long does it take to get to the questions? And I'm like, oh, we usually do them that week. And she was like, because I sent one in like, you know, weeks ago. Well, she didn't do rabbit trail at obcc.church she did rabbit trail at obcc.com oh so i wonder who has that one so people (laughs) yeah so uh so yeah rabbit trail at obcc.church if you don't send it there we're not going to answer your questions so i assured her we weren't ignoring her (laughs) and we would get to it so that's another reason why we decided to do this bonus one was to get to her question quickly so uh, as soon as we got it so Here we go. Ready, Mm. Steve? Yeah, I think I'm ready. All right. So here's the question. It's from Anna Pisani. She is a longtime listener. Uh, Love you, Anna, for all you do around here. You're amazing. So here she says, she says, she starts it off saying, hello, gentlemen. So once again, she's leaving Greg completely out of this conversation. (laughs) So hello, gentlemen. First, I want to say how much I enjoy the Rabbit Trail podcast. Your discussions on week's sermon and the way that you tackle bab- biblical questions from listeners have been a real highlight for me. Keep up the fantastic work and know that you have a loyal listener here eagerly waiting for each new episode. Wow. Ah, thank you. A um, couple of questions, um, and we're going to break this down. I'll just read the first question first, and then I'll read the second question later. Um, So uh, a couple of questions. The first one is, I recently had the privilege of attending several church services where Alistair Begg delivered the sermons. Uh, My wife loves Alistair Begg, by the way. He's he's amazing. That is the voice. Yeah. Yeah, The accent. Yes, Scottish accent. And so (laughs) everything he says is biblical. Uh, Got a great uh, voice. (laughs) before, Before a few of them, he requested that the congregation not clap after his sermon or after the worship band performed. I cannot remember his exact words, but I believed his reasoning that was that all glory and praise should be directed solely to God, not to him, not to the band. His request prompted me to reflect on the reason I applaud after a worship band finishes. Uh, I believe clapping is my way of saying amen. What are your thoughts? Do you think the applause is more for the worship band as a way of saying good job or for God's glory? So... Steven, I'll let you take this. Oh, I'm going to take this all by myself. Well, no, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll, get, my, oh. I'll get my two cents in. <laughs> yeah, no, I love Alistair Begg. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know what context. I would. It'd be nice to know what that clip looked like because, you know, it could have been in the moment of some kind of thing. And so sometimes you don't get it in its context. Well, it sounded like live. 
Yeah, but I mean, like, was he talking to his congregation? Mm-hmm. Was he talking to the cameras? What, you know, so sometimes I think pastors are giving instructions that seem like they're universal, but really they're to their own flock. They know their own flock really well. Maybe he's worried about what's going on, and so he throws out this caution. Um, but I think that is an interesting question because it comes up a lot, you know, um, in the sense of the fact that people... Um, like performers just working in theater and working with musicians before um, that people get in this situation where they kind of feel like, Oh, I don't want to take the glory away from God. So I'm going to act like I'm not here as a vessel. And oftentimes the congregation isn't even aware of that. You know, oftentimes if you're playing music and you're doing it and people are worshiping, they're not even focused on the band. Some people might be, some people might be doing the right thing physically up on the stage and in their heart, it's completely different, right? And so a lot of this, I think, is just um, not so much the way people present themselves, but just kind of the way in which people um, in their heart kind of view something. And so oftentimes, like when I'm doing drama, you have to draw attention to yourself or you're doing theater on a stage. The actors have to draw attention to themselves. And people will like, well, you worship arts artists that I've talked to over the years kind of struggle with this because they feel like I don't want to be the rock star and the center of the band. But oftentimes I think that's more of an internal problem than it is maybe an external one of an attitude that everyone can see. If it's everyone can see it, it's probably pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like I don't mind. I actually think it's a celebratory clap. You know, Um, we've viewed things like when we were at a concert or something or you watch somebody talk and you really enjoy it. The uh, the proper response out of everyone is to clap. And they're not just clapping at the person on the stage. They're clapping about the words, everything that's being said, the fact that they're together with a group of people. So I think when people are clapping after a song, I, I think that's a heart condition that you can't really recognize. And so it's totally fine to be like, you know, I'm just worshiping the Lord. I'm just celebrating with this clap with a group of people. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I look at it. But yeah, he may have a different opinion. No, I, I mean, I don't think it's that different. But, um, you know, First Timothy 4, 4 says, for everything created uh, by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. So, so again, nothing, um, nothing should be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. I will say this. Personally, whenever I clap during a worship mm-hmm. service um, or even um, a sermon, my applause is not ever directed at the band. It is never directed at the speaker. It is an affirmation of, uh, of God, you know, and it is an aspect of me physically worshiping and acknowledging what God is doing. Um, And also, there is that aspect of it, too, that we're in community when we are in in, in a service. So it is a way that we all together can celebrate God, you know. So to me, it, it is a community thing uh, of worshiping God, not not really giving giving thanks to the band, um, uh, and uh, and 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 just really just being part of a community. And I think I think being part of community and worshiping together in community is there's there's part of it is a communal connection in that too. And I think that's where the applause or, you know, an amen or, you know, a hallelujah or whatever during the service uh, is appropriate. And it's, to me, it's always directed to God. It's never like, oh, you know, unless of course the band plays Agnes Day. Then I will <laughs> give them, hey, good for you. You guys finally played Agnes Day. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Um, you know, and, and so again, I, I do think that, you know, Alistair Begg, and nothing against him, I love him, I love his teaching, I think he's sound, um, but I do think that he comes from more of a high church. Yeah, he comes from um, reform, Reformed, I believe. Yeah, and Presbyterian, right? Uh-huh. Um, you know, so so it's more of a high church the idea, so, so I think that there, you know, part of it is that culture for him, um, but yeah, I, I do think, too, that, you know, uh, like Greg, I think, mentioned too, when people run up and say, thank you, oh, that was a great sermon, you did a great job, you know, that there's this conflict in him where Mm. it's like, how do I point this to God and not just receive it? But again, right here, you know, um, nothing is really to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, you know, and so, so appreciate and thank you, but you know, this is God, not me, you know, Mm -hmm. so again, when it comes to applause, if it comes to that, I think part of it is if if you're a band member, you know, and you're like, yeah, baby, bring it on. That's what I'm saying. You know, then then I think there's issues. But, uh, you know, for us to celebrate God together, but be totally stoic with no emotion, 
you know, or energy is not worship. I mean, even David was like, hey, I will yeah. be I will be undignified in my worship, you know. Um, and so to me, I think that I think it's totally appropriate. I, I always feel it's directed to God and it's really just an affirmation of, of him moving, mm. you know. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. So like, like I, think I agree with you when, it, when she says, you know, I think it's a way of saying amen. But again, you know, in everything, evaluate your heart, you know, whether you're on a worship team or, you know, whether you're in the audience and, you know, always evaluate where your affections are going, where your, you know, what is moving you and why it's moving you, you know. So I don't think that part's bad, but I would encourage people to, to worship together in community, connect together in community, and raise the roof, you know. Yeah, the only thing I think about clapping is, uh, can you do it on the beat during the song? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's oh. the hard part. <laughs> okay, that's the thing. I will applaud. I won't necessarily clap during a song because inevitably I, I am off beat. <laughs> you know, start out on beat and then I get carried away and then I realize, why is everybody else doing it on the offbeat? You no, know? <laughs> it's me. So, all right, her second question, and this is the one that we'll probably spend some time yeah. on. And, and it's again, a very this, different question. This may be a very, you know, a much shorter episode. Um, so, uh, so, Nancy, I know that you always like, your podcasts are way too long. This one might be more up your alley. So, <laughs> um, so sh she goes on to say on her second question, I have a friend at who at one time was a committed Christ follower. She was a youth leader, Bible teacher. For several reasons, she has decided that she is not one of God's chosen. She believes he hates her and he curses her daily. We used to be able to discuss this, sharing Bible verses, but no movement on either side was ever made. Several Bible verses seem to emphasize God's sovereign choice and of certain individuals or groups for his divine purposes. Romans 9.13 addresses God's election of Jacob over Esau. In Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, we read about God's predestination of believers. My friend argues these are just some verses that suggest that God has chosen a specific group of people for salvation and special service. However, there are many verses that emphasize God's universal love and desire for all to be saved. John 3.16 for one. Second Peter 3.9 tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. This makes me wonder how we are to reconcile God's election of his chosen ones with his desire for all to know and follow him. Does God's election mean that some are predestined for salvation while others are not? If so, how do we understand the role of human choice and responsibility in the process of salvation? Can we choose God without the prompting of the Holy Spirit? How can we make sense of God's desire for all to be saved while also acknowledging his sovereignty in choosing some? I imagine you've all been faced with this question before, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about it. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, and yes, I think we've all had this question, discussed this question, wrestled through this question. Um, and I will let me just start out this conversation by saying this. Um, two things. Number one, this is an age-old argument. Um, it's the Calvinist versus Arminian arguments um or free will and, versus yeah determinism. free will versus the sovereignty of god and 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 um and uh and determination um and so so again these arguments have been going on by great men of god by great scholars you know of scripture and the debate is still out there so we're not going to settle this today you know by any means probably um, to not someone's everyone's satisfaction at yeah. least and, and I would say, too, that we are um, highly unlikely to even land on a position, you know, that uh, we're not trying to land the plane and say one camp is wrong and one camp is right. Partly because this is a secondary issue. You know, Especially it's not a primary our... issue. Um, and so we do believe as a church, um, and I, we both believe as, as fellow Christians, that there's freedom in secondary issues. So let me just explain that really quick. Um, a primary issue is, or an essential issue, 
is a theological position that you have to agree on. For Stephen and I, or for another believer, we have to be in agreement that these statements are true. Because if they're not true, then the gospel itself breaks down. It's like pulling a thread from a sweater, and the sweater just unravels. So if you get away from any of the primary or essential issues, like Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he lived a sinless life, because if he didn't, he died for his sin, not ours. Mm. He was born of a virgin birth because it broke the chain of sin from Adam. He, you know, um, So all of these things, he died, he rose again, he's, he's coming, coming back. Again. You know, So all of these things would be essential primary beliefs. There's one God and three persons. Uh, and in those things, we would divide. So a secondary issue or a non-essential issue are things that can be defended in Scripture, whichever position you take. Um, but it's not something that we would divide over, and it's not something that would destroy the gospel, right? So if you're a Calvinist and you believe in the Calvinist position, you know, when, when you know, you're not saying anything different about the gospel um, necessarily that would break down the gospel. Um, and, and so those types of things. So other secondary issues are eschatology, whether it's pre-trib or post-trib or whatever. Um, you know, those are secondary issues. I think they're fun to discuss. I think they're important to discuss because it forces you to take God out of that little box that you've placed him in um, and, and realize that God is much bigger than how you have pigeonholed him. Um, I will say this, though. With the Calvinist-Arminian debate... Um, that can be a very emotional debate and one that you <laughs> want to divide over and you want to convince the other one. So in that sense, if you can discuss it with the intention that I want to grow and learn, um, and then I think it's healthy. Uh, if you are trying to beat somebody up and prove them wrong, um, then I don't think it is healthy for unity or, or anything else, and I don't think any good really comes of it. I would spend, much rather spend my time evangelizing to somebody than trying to convince them, you know, uh, of a certain position that is secondary. Um, you know, what I, the unique part about being here at the church is that we allow for both positions and we can still continue in doing the ministry. Some churches, that's a very vital part of their systematic theology, so for them, they feel like it's, even though it's a secondary issue, it's a primary issue for them and their church governance, and this is how you get denominations. But what most people would say on either side of the free will determinism situation is that if you believe in the core essentials, we would still be considered part of the universal church and that we're all Christians. We just disagree over this particular issue. And some people don't like to talk about these issues because they are divisive, but I would say that they're divisive because we have emotions. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to make it a philosophical conversation and then they go, I don't like this, it's frustrating. I'm like, well, that's, an, that's not no longer philosophical anymore. It's meaningful to you or you don't see the meaning in it. And I, what I like about the question is that there are some real world com um, ramifications on where you land and some difficulties, whatever position you hold, in light of how you see God. And so I'm, my biggest worry here is with your friend, because the, your friend here is said she was a committed follower, a youth leader, a Bible teacher, um, and, f and for several reasons has chosen to believe that God hates her. And to me, that's that's the the difficulty part. I mean, I wish I knew that story. Well, I, it sounds to me, uh, it sounds to me like she realized she came to a realization in herself that she is not one of the one chosen. of the chosen. That's what so it sounds she like, is, right? She is condemned to hell, and therefore, you know, and yeah. basically, you know, the scriptures say you're an enemy of mine, you know, until you are saved, right? So yeah, no, and so maybe that's where that came from. Maybe, but there are a lot of people that use this these kinds of phrases, and I don't know if this is your friend or not, that have deconstructed their faith because of uh, what I consider to be hyper Calvinistic positions. One of them was the Westboro Baptists. Um, you know, a lot, they're extremely Calvinist in some of their positions. And one of the girls left that particular faith that she wanted to be a Christian, but she couldn't get over Romans 9. And so she couldn't think of Jacob and Esau and all of that stuff. And so she says, God just hates people and makes them to be hated. So she can't believe in that God. And so she's not going to believe in any of Christianity. And, uh, uh, you know, that's a sad position because that's not the only position you can take. And so a lot of this times comes down to, I, I was listening to John Piper, pretty Calvinist, right? And I, I want to just hear both sides of the argument. Um, and he was saying, look, on this particular issue, um, 
if if you're going to think that God is this evil God that he just hates you and you know and it's because of this doctrine he goes even though I think you're wrong then don't believe this particular doctrine <laughs> hmm. there's another belief that he still considers Christian right. that you can hold to if this is what you're going to think of God because no matter what position you hold you have to think of God as a loving caring God who offers you know offers his love to you um, and so I thought that was refreshing because, you know, there are people who are very Calvinist that may seem and appear that they don't think that, you know, that there are some people that are, you know, they can't seek out God and that that's what they're made for. But I don't find that to be the case with every Calvinist, and I don't find that to be the case with, uh, you know, with a lot of people. So my concern is that um, whatever you hold to this position, uh, that did I, my biggest worry is that you've misconstrued the, the nature and the heart of God. And the Bible just says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart and you have a certain amount of capacity, whether you really have it or not, all this stuff, if you can choose to follow him because you believe he's real and you believe he's loving and you believe he died for your sins, that's, that's enough. And then you can find out in heaven whether you were elect or not. But for me, it's the thinking that God cursed you. I, I don't see any scriptural area where God is saying like, oh, uh, every day you, know, you believe that God hates you and is cursing you. Um, I, I think God, uh, we use the word hate in the Bible quite a bit and in some of these texts. And part of it could be coming from, you know, she brought up the Esau um, yeah. one is, you know, headed. as it is written, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. Yeah. You know, so. And so you're in Romans there, right? That's in Romans yeah, 9. So you're in Romans 9. And so just to give you a different perspective that I think might help your friend, since even uh, if you were a Piper guy, I'm going to give you the opposite view of how you could look at that passage. So when you're in Romans 9, you're talking about Jacob and Esau. And what we have done in the modern sense is sometimes... Hello, for those of you just watching, you probably saw a bit of a glitch there. We had some recording problems, but we're back on track, and so I just wanted to continue off here. We left off where we're talking in Jacob and Esau in Romans chapter eight, uh, 9, um, and so one of the questions that she asked was, you know, you have verses like, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, and so I just wanted to kind of go to the verse here and kind of just read it, and so we're here in verse uh, 11. I'll pick it up, uh, verse 10, and not only so, but also with Rebecca, and who conceived nothing either good or bad, in order that God's prom proposed of election might continue, uh, not because of the works, but because of him who calls. She who called the elder will serve the younger, for it is written, Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. And what this passage is talking about, as you're going through Romans, and this is usually the key verse for Calvinists, but also this is where most of your debates are going to come from, this one and probably Ephesians, um, you get this kind of background and the Hebrew understanding of, of this idea between God choosing. And so one of the things I wanted to present was just kind of how this is looked at. And so for, for, for many Arminius Calvinists, uh, most Calvinists, I would say, and I wouldn't necessarily want to argue for Arminianism. For me, it's, there's a many positions besides Calvin. So there's just free will predestination people. That's kind of the two camps that fall into this. But this is a summary of God's plan of salvation all the way to Christ through the promised seed, right? So if you're a Calvinist, you're going to see that passage and you're going to say that God chose Jacob to be a part of the salvation plan, but he chose not to elect Esau. You think that's a fair statement since I know you kind of fall more in that. Um, and so he, he's choosing before they were born who would be the one that God chose. Now, the question I have is what, what kind of choosing is this? If it's a salvific choosing, it means he's saying Esau is not saved and Jacob is saved, then that would be more in line with the Calvinist. But the kind of way I see this or the way others would see this in a Jewish context is that this is not just about the salvific plan uh, being each individual within that plan being saved or unsaved, kind of like we are now. But this is talking about who God chose to bring about a promised seed. And so from Adam all the way the, from, from the Garden of Eden, God's talking about this seed. And he's talking about this plural seed that's going to come out that's always linked to people. And it's usually linked to nations. And so you have Jacob as a father of a nation and Esau as a father of a nation. And so you have the corporate setting and the individual setting. Now, unfortunately, oftentimes people compare like, well, is this a corporate body of Jacob and Esau representing countries and their groups of people? Or is this just every individual in the camp? And I would say before we get to that question, the most important thing about this passage here when you're going through the history is that the plan of salvation that we have now is a bigger plan than sometimes we give it credit for. And God chose a group of people to bring about Jesus, to bring about his physical birth. And the people in that choosing 
didn't necessarily follow Yahweh or not. It didn't have anything to do, in, and when I look at this, with their salvation. Because you have David's lineage, and we know David's lineage did not always follow Yahweh. They followed other gods. But they are still chosen, whether they want to be or not, to be a part of the plan to bring about the salvation that came through Jesus. So that's how a, a non-Calvinist would look at this text. He would say it is corporate and individual, because individuals were chosen, whether they wanted to serve Yahweh or not to bring about the birth of Jesus. And so that, to me, when I read that, that's kind of what I'm seeing. The Calvinists would say, yes, that, but also that they are easy, being chosen in a salvific way. And so this passage gets used a lot to show that God does pick some people and he disfavors other. The question in the debate is really, what kind of picking is that? And for those of you that don't really understand uh, the, the Calvinist-Armenian debate, um, and I know I'm oversimplifying it, so... <laughs> Um, so we don't need a lot of cards and letters saying I got this wrong. But, but here's, here's kind of the crux of it, right? The Calvinist position <clears throat> focuses on the sovereignty of God, right? So the idea that he chooses whom he will save, he chooses whom he will have mercy on, and he also, in retrospect, chooses who he won't, right? So, the, so it's about the sovereignty of God. God chooses, man responds. So then when you go to the Arminian position, you know, the focus is on the free will of man. I choose, and then God responds. So both sides would say that everyone is condemned and deserves to go to hell, so they're in agreement there. But how, you know, how um, happens. salvation happens, how the gr gra God's grace is passed out is, is up for debate. <clears throat> so if you go down even further where he stopped on verse 14 in chapter 9 of Romans, so it, it says this, so what should we say then after he says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated? So what should we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Well, by no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Um, so so here's, the, here's the thing, right? Um, everybody would agree that Mankind sinned, was condemned to hell, um, and if God never chose to show his mercy or his grace upon mankind, um, he would be just and right in doing so, right? I mean, if somebody commits a heinous crime and goes to prison for life and nobody, you know, the governor does not choose to give him a, what is that called? A, a pardon. A pardon, Right then the governor is just in not granting that pardon. He is serving the sentence for which he was condemned, right? So in that sense, um, you know, both sides would kind of agree that, yeah, if God didn't show his grace and his mercy upon us and, and, and redeem us, he was okay in doing that, making that decision. But now the emotions come up because it's like, if God chooses, this is unfair. If mankind chooses, well, then it's okay. Um, well, the, the, the problem is the word choice, right? So right. The, the, I think both would say God chooses to show mercy on who he has. The question is, is that in relation to salvation, right? So um, Calvinists would say even in salvation, God has the mercy to choose. Probably I, someone who wasn't a Calvinist would say something more along the lines that God can allow us to choose and still pick out the outcome and still be sovereign. And so this idea is that you have to hold and wrestle is that God is a sovereign God who, once he decrees something, he's still a loving, kind, but just God, and he makes perfect choices. So you have to have that in who you think God is. On the other hand, God gives us a certain amount of what the Bible calls choice. It uses the phrase, choose this day whom you will serve. And then the Work question, out your salvation with fear, fear and trembling. Yeah, and so you have these passages that are in contention for some people, and so people are, have different systems on how to work out that contention. For others, they feel like the, the lessening the sovereignty of God and his choosing of people makes him not, all, all, not sovereign. For others, they say if God can allow people to make choices and still wrestle with the outcome and know what the outcome is going to be. Right. And so that's really where people settle on the particular debate. The question is whether, you know, what 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 does the passage say about uh, choosing? So oftentimes, um, you know, we overlook the passage, even in this section, we're talking about a history of this promised seed that Jesus was a part of, where he takes a group of people, he adopts them, they become a part of his, and then within their ranks, not all of them worship him. And so now we're at the point where they have forsaken him, and he's taking a new group of people and choosing to show mercy on whom he will show mercy, instead of going, well, you're just born into it because I'm a Jew. So from a Jewish point of view, they're like, hey, we're the chosen people. God adopted us. 
how come we're not a part of the salvation plan? And he was like, well, I chose you to bring about Jesus, and then you rejected Jesus. So that would be the way that this would be looked at from kind of more of a, a Hebrew understanding. So the other one is the word love and hate is an Old Testament phrase that's often not used like we use it today. We say, oh, I hate, and we think of never, you should never hate. And that isn't necessarily how it's used. In the Old Testament, love and hate is often used broadly and more to a sense than we use it today. Today, we just it's despised, disgust. Back then, it was just favored or unfavored in some passages. So there's even passages where this phrase that's used in Hebrew is not talking about not loving. So there was a passage where... Uh, where uh, it's talking about Abraham had two, uh, uh, I think it was Jacob had two wives, uh, Rachel and Leah, and he said he loved one, but Ra- Rachel was he he was unloved. It's the same word for hate, mm. but we translate it hate be- it, unloved because it fits the the text better. Mm. And so the reason why they're doing it is they're making a comparison to, oh, Jacob favored one wife over the other. It didn't mean he didn't like her, or and it's the same kind of language used when God says I chose Abraham's f- seed. I chose Isaac over Ishmael. It didn't mean he didn't love Ishmael. In fact, he blesses Ishmael and gives him a nation. But he says, you're not the chosen. You're not my elect, but I am blessing you. So it's not a matter of like love and hate. But the, Jesus uses this too. He says, if you have to hate your family, if you're going to serve me, he's not saying, oh, go hate your family. Tell them they're yeah. disgusting. He's saying your love for them is so little comparison to your love for me. It looks like hate in comparison. Because yeah. that would be a contradiction. Love your yeah. brother and then hate, hate him. him. You know, yeah. And so there's a contradiction there. This, so There's a so, language problem that we get. And that's what I think is going on here. And he loves one and hates one is more about favor. In fact, you can look it up in most lexicons. You can see it as love and hate. And that would be more of a Calvinist point of view. But in this text, you can also see it as God. God favors one over the other and chooses that person to be a part of the blessing. And I think even a Calvinist would argue, like, God still loves them, but not, in, you know, I don't know if all of them would, but there's still, like, an expression of God giving them common grace to both groups of people, but this one he's inviting to be a part of something. So, and I wrote down trying a, to be fair. I wrote position. down a couple of passages here yeah. just, to kind of, just to kind of show the tension in this argument and the fact that both sides— can interpret the scripture to kind of fit their filter. If it's um, their systematic you know, theology. Yeah, and, um, and, and so it's, it's not always really clear, right? Well, it's Otherwise, difficult. it wouldn't be an argument anymore, right? So, uh, so like, you know, John, John uh, 6, 37, it says, All the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Okay, so here's one of the passages that is up for debate between Calvinist and Arminian camps. Mm -hmm. So the Calvinists would argue that this passage teaches irresistible grace, that when God chooses you, you respond. Um, You know, he was given, and so you, and and so you're his. Um, So uh, an individual can't refuse God's choice. Therefore, all those given to Christ will respond. Arminians would reply that those given to me um, are the same as those who believe in him in verse 40 um and uh and so when god foresees that some will believe he gives them to christ um you see that in in verse 45 those who have heard and learned from the father are the ones who come to me so that you've got the the two uh edges there and romans 9 um in romans 9 the calvinist position in romans 9 teaches unconditional um election and predestination, double predestination, whatever. Uh, And this is because they're focusing on those passage referring to an individual person, like you were saying. You know, they're focused on the person, um, whereas Arminian position on those focus, focus not on the man, but God's choice of a nation and their role in his plans to to redeem mankind. And so, so again, it's, is it the person? Is it the nation's? Um, and so, uh, so again, you know, Arminians would argue that Romans is dealing with the choice of nations and that role. Um, and any interpretation of Romans 9 has got to account for the transition that Paul makes from, from a national choice in verses 1 through 5 um, and individual salvation in verses 24 and 33. Therefore, neither view can claim that the other is completely out of context. The question becomes one of which transition is more believable or what translation is more believable and makes the most sense. Um, and which do also uh, taking into account the Old Testament passages as well, right? And, and, and what I'm kind of saying is it's easy to 
pick out a couple of scriptures and then build a theology on it. You know, well, especially where, if you're going with a presupposition. Yeah, and 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 so we we do have to guard against that to some degree. And and I like that idea of allowing the wholeness of scripture interpret scripture. You know, and not just simple verses. So when you look at the plan of salvation from the garden to revelation, you know, does it look like it is just the few or does it look like it is the many, you know? Um, well, the third option would be both. I mean, yeah. and that is one that I would argue and contend for that when oftentimes you're talking about salvation, the promised seed is Jesus, but it's also anyone who's in Jesus, right. which is a nation, right? So, so the same thing would be said that you could make a really good argument that both have some aspect of the truth, that it is both a corporate and individual spec uh, section in that. In and that I would passage. say, I would say too, both, I do believe the Calvinist position and the Arminian position. Or non-Calvinist, non because you know, there's so many. Or non-Calvinist, yeah. okay, whatever. Because there's like four They're or five. They're both flawed. Of, yeah. I mean, you know, both positions are flawed, and I would say don't dig your heels too far deep into either camp. Um, you know, I remember Pastor Ike, one of the founding pastors, when I when I was wrestling with all this and I'm like, you know, I remember asking him, you know, OK, what you know, what camp are you in? And he goes, I am in Jesus's camp, <laughs> you know, um, and and so so really don't dig your heels too far into any um, doctrine like that to a large degree, because here's the thing. If you take Calvinism and go and follow that road all the way down, you know, the more extreme and more extreme you go down that road, then, then you actually make God responsible for sin and evil. And, you know, and if you go too far down the Arminian path, you know, and the free will of man and all this, where God is responding to us, you, you get to a point where you, there's open theism. Right. Where God has no idea what's going on. He's just he's, waiting he's just you reacting, choose. you know, to, oh, my gosh, let me, you know. And so so both camps, when they if you get too far outside of the norm, gets very heretical. And so you do and have to be on both and you do have to be very careful um, and strike that balance. I mean, for me, you know, I grew up uh, when I first gave my life to the Lord. I grew up in Calvary Chapel, which is very Arminian. Um, and when I was first introduced to the Calvinist view in a Bible study going through Romans, it shook me and I was angry and I was arguing and I was, it, I mean, the good thing is it really caused me to, to, <laughs> to, to, to well, you know, really examine the scriptures and argue and build a case. Um, and, and one of the, really where I landed in that um, is uh, I realized this um, for myself is there is tension that's going to exist because God is sovereign. And I think both sides would say that God is sovereign, you know, um, and God created man in his image and God is a free being. So he created man with free will. And so how does that work? Yeah, right. The God, paradox work? God, in God's sovereignty, then, you know, he has to make the choice and you just respond well, he created us with free will, too. So that decision to follow Christ is a cooperative decision. And I don't believe that God gives up any of his sovereignty in allowing you to make a decision. And and I think that, you know, we do have to be prompted by the Holy Spirit to be open. And so, therefore, that free will is is in the midst of God's sovereignty and his act. So... You know, I do think that that there is tension there and we should be comfortable with that tension because I also believe, you know, when you look at God being just and he is meeting out his justice completely, um, when you meet out justice completely, there is no room for mercy because <laughs> once mercy is involved, justice isn't complete in that regard. <clears throat> and I know there's going to be some tension in that statement, you know, from Greg. But, um, but on the other side, if if you and if you're in, injecting mercy, then justice isn't fully meted out. But the scriptures are clear that mercy and justice were completely meted out f in its fullness. How does that work out? There is tension, and it's a miracle, and really it, it paradox, is something usually. that only God can do, right? And so again, we want, you know. We want both, and there is a tension that exists in it, and we have to be comfortable with that because God is not 
defined or confined. Um, out, you know, yeah. I know. I just so usually this becomes a problem. Like right now, we're having a conversation. It might be a little wonky for you. You might think, well, what am I thinking? Um, I think it's always good to ask, what have I already adopted that I might not be aware of? Like I can kind of tell some people's background because like some some denominations don't express that they come from an Armenian background or a free will background or some kind of other choice background that favors choice over the way that others look at sovereignty. And they don't know that. That's just the way they've been taught. And same thing with Reformed people that I've met in churches that are Calvinist. They just That's just what they were taught. What they weren't taught is another perspective. And so you know when the, when the buzzword comes up. You know, um, you know, like, you know, uh, is God in control of everything? Yes. Okay. So do we have free will? And then whatever makes you most angry is the one I typically (laughs) find out. Like, well, God is God of love. He would never allow, you know, okay, well, then you're probably following or trained up to think through things from that perspective. If you're saying like God is sovereign and he needs to be respected and then, okay, so you're probably grew up in that kind of a background or at least adopted that from the theology that you read. And I would say just with a, with a, open hand and open heart feel free to read both sides of the things that are not heretical and really kind of compare which one you're really comfortable putting the mystery in you either put the mystery in god is more sovereign and i don't know how free will works or i i i know that god gives us free will but i know he's still sovereign and i don't know how that works and so you kind of got to wrestle with that but oftentimes too what avoids the this discrepancy is oftentimes when we're talking about these passages we fight over these particular systematics when the passage isn't even that much concerned about it right so uh, for instance um, when we're talking about Jacob I love you saw hate it's talking about how God is broadening the spectrum of bringing people into the kingdom by allowing Gentiles to enter Mm -hmm. somehow that gets mixed up in the debate where God is shrinking everybody down to just a few people that he's chosen and I'm like that's the passage is very clear that we're talking about um, we're talking about God going, you know what? It's not just Jews. It's everyone. And they're like, let's limit it back to, you know, a group right. of people. And I'm like, OK. And a lot of this is just about how God does something. But it still looks the same, I think, in practice, whether you're uh, Armenian or Calvinist or a free will determinist, depending on how extreme you are in those positions. From a man's point of view, when I see someone raising their hand saying, I love Jesus, and they're acting like a Christian, and then they choose not to then I have to respond to the choices that they're giving me in the same way. Now, the why they're doing it is just the inside knowledge that you can kind of speculate on. My response to them is still to preach the gospel to them. And this becomes important because if you start thinking you know the particulars, like did Jesus, the Holy Spirit hit you first, and then you read the Bible, and then the Bible told you about Jesus? Or or did the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit in the Bible? Is, is the words, you know, it's like, now you're trying to figure out the mechanism. The question is, do you respond to the call? Mm. And so to me, it's like, I give you the call. Do you follow Jesus? And so that's why I think with this particular question, what, what strikes me is that somehow this person has believed something different about God. And I'm more concerned about that because I think that whatever you think about the mechanism of how salvation is brought to an individual, the, the thing you all get is that Jesus died for your sins. Right. And if you respond to that, and you say, you know what, I know you're a loving and kind God, even though I can't understand all the stuff about you, and you see the example that he gave you on how to live, and you feel it like inclined and pushed or pressured or thought or, or logic, whatever it is that gets you to go, I see the truth of this, and you submit it all to that God and Jesus and that example, then you know the real God. If you're saying, like, no, you know what, God just doesn't love me, I just must be one of those people that's chosen for hell, and so therefore I'm just going to do whatever I want, well, that sounds like a choice still. You're, you, you see that you could not do this thing, and you could do this other thing. And so if I knew God was real, the question is, is he a loving God? Now, if you really don't think he's a loving God, then you would reject him, and that's pretty much what anyone would do. And so for me, when, when, when you think, the, this, I, I believe in God, but I don't believe he's a loving, kind God, so mm-hmm. then you're, you're, you're choosing to, to choose that about him, and you see him in that light, and I would say that's not really God. Yeah, and I and I, I just want to agree with Stephen. And my main concern in here isn't really to land in a camp of um, Armenian or Calvinist. It is to address the question um, of Anna's friend who feels as though she is not one of the chosen, and God hates her, and and therefore she has no relationship with God. I think the scriptures are clear that um, that the call of salvation is for everybody. You know, and I mean, you know, even said to the Jew first, then to the Gentile, you know, go to Samaria, which was the enemy, and, you know, go to all the ends of the earth. So, obviously, 
it is open for everybody and uh, and all we have to do is answer the call when it's presented to us um and in that sense too it doesn't matter how we feel right um and let me just this kind of weird story but i'm going to share it anyway um <clears throat> when when i was growing up and i don't remember i was probably i was probably five maybe i think and my older sister was like seven um, and she tortured me my whole life. So we are, we get along great, but you know, when we were growing up, we didn't, and she tortured me my whole life. Um, and I remember we were sitting on the front yard one day and, uh, and again, this is my memories. So, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so they're take it, take it with that. But, but, um, she, she believes this too. Um, we're sitting on the front grass one time and I'm like five, she's like seven, I think. And she was telling me, you know, um, Hey, I heard mom and dad talking last night. And they hate you. <laughs> and I'm like, no, they don't. Yeah, no, mom and dad, they hate you. They don't want you. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And she's like, no, grandma, grandma hates you. And I'm like, no, she doesn't. Yes, she does. And she goes, and then you know what? Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny hate you. And so I'm crying. And, and I'm like, I'm going to go to ask mom. And she's like, no, no, don't. Um, she's like, the only reason mom and dad haven't gotten rid of you is because you don't know. If you ask them, then they'll know you know, and you're gone. And, um, and as torturous as that was, right, it really made me insecure growing up. I mean, I remember being six years old, and this was legal at that time, where, you know, your parents, your mom would go into the grocery store, and she said, you wait in the car, <laughs> I'm going to just run in and pick up something. And I would like, be plastered to the window thinking, she, oh my gosh, she's sneaking out the back door, and she's going to wait until I go into the store, and then she's going to jump in the car, and she's going to leave me, and I'm abandoned. And went to my cousin's house, and we went on this bike ride, and she turned around, and I have no idea where I'm at, you know. And she turned around, and she goes, I'm going to run back home real quick. I forgot something. I'll be right back. Stay here. And I'm thinking... This is it. My mom talked to her. She told her to leave me here and abandon me. And so I had this idea in my head that my parents didn't love me. They didn't want me, which is so untrue because they totally were great parents. They didn't love me. They didn't want me. They were just waiting for the opportunity to abandon me. But the truth in that is it didn't matter how I felt or what I thought. My parents absolutely loved me. They were absolutely committed to me, and I was absolutely their child, and I wasn't going anywhere. So again, I would warn that friend, if, if you believe this or if you feel this way, it does not necessarily matter in the scope that you do belong to Christ if you follow him and you choose to follow him, and, uh, and you see it all along, right? Jesus on the road with the rich man, you know, do this, and he chose not to do it. Yeah. It wasn't like he didn't give him an opportunity to follow him, but the guy chose not to follow him. Yeah. And I'm telling you, you know, I don't know how I can convince that friend or people that are feeling that way. You choose to follow God, and he will not reject you. So, yeah. you know, he didn't go through all of that. <laughs> he didn't go through all of that so that he could reject you, right? And, um, and, and I will say, too, that, um, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. So, yeah, <laughs> no, I, just along the lines, um, you, you know, this becomes a problem oftentimes mm. when you believe something false about who who God is. And if it were just a philosoph philosophical conversation about because uh, this is a conversation people have had in the secular world. Are we determined and fated to our cause or do we have choice to change things or, you know, or has all the factors already been put in play and we're just kind of acting out of play or do we have any kind of autonomy uh, to make decisions in our life? So this isn't just a Christian debate. I was really shocked that that was the case when I went to college and they were debating it in the psychology department. You know, if, if, if you do experiments on people, they have to be somewhat predictable. But at the same time, if you could predict everything about them, then they have no choice in the matter. So why do the study? So this would be the conversation that's going on. And the same is true for this. But unlike that philosophical conversation, what you have in Christianity is a model. And you have someone saying, okay, I know this is confusing. This might be a paradox for you. You may not be able to see how sovereignty works and free will. But what, what, what I'll do is give you an example of how the Almighty God responds to the people he created. And so the Father gives his most precious gift, 
He gives the Son to us to die for us on our behalf, that if we follow him, then we're in Christ, and now God can raise us up on the last day. And so it says, I gave you him as a gift, and you accept the gift, right? And so regardless of the mechanism, that's the thing that Jesus preached. And so you have this model of a man who walked this earth, and how he cared for people, and how he loved them, and, and how he called people to him. And some people, he gave them difficult messages, and they had to wrestle with it. And either they got closer to him, or they pulled away. And so to me, I think that if you pull away and say, no, no, that Jesus, he's not, he's not really a loving, kind God. He's really just an evil guy who cho- chooses to curse people. Then you are making that as a choice and a perception. But I would say, go back and look at the data. Go back and look at the example of Christ in the Gospels, what he did on the cross, how he treated people, how he treated people of lower class, how he treated the poor, the rich, the wealthy. Everyone he gave an example of how to live a godly life, how to live as the Father would have us live. And it's just a beautiful example because you don't get that in any other passage or scriptures. So because I have that, I can get to a point in my faith where something in the rest of the Bible is confusing for me and go, you know what? I don't know. I can't. Now, I think I do know, like I think I have my own opinion, and I'll I'll share that in a minute. But I think before we get to the kind of specifics of what would would each of us believe, I think you got to realize that my faith isn't based on deterministic outcomes of philosophical discussions of free will. It's based on Jesus. And I have a model and a person of Jesus to look at to say what kind of God I serve. And that was given to me as a precious gift from the Father. So that's my thing. So now when I encounter, like, how does such and such work? Or where do the dinosaurs fit in? And all this other stuff that people argue over. That's all great. And I'm, I can say, I don't, I don't, I can say, I know, or here's what I think, or here's my best guess. But really, I, my faith is based on Christ. And so I can, I can, now I'm free to explore things that are difficult for my brain. So when my brain hurts, I can go be like, well, I still have Jesus and then I can still now I can enjoy those conversations without the existential angst that comes to think, am I am I really saved? I'm like, well, do you love Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Do you follow him? Yeah. When you stumble, do you ask for forgiveness? Yeah. OK, well, then you probably love him. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's just like, so you're OK. And so don't don't get in the anxiety issues that a lot of these issues bring out in people, because if you know you're doing something because not your will, your affection, your might is it is pivoted in the direction towards God and what he did for you. So, and, I just think and it's important. I, and I would say, you know, whatever position you're reading from, you know, a lot of times when you have that that dogma <laughs> as you're approaching scripture, there's a lot of linguistic gymnastics that you have to do to prove your point, you know. Um, and that's one of the issues I've, I, I had with um, Calvinism when I was studying it was every time the scriptures say for all, then they were like, well, that doesn't mean all. That means all the elect, you know. So it really means some, but it says all. And so to me, it's like, that doesn't really make sense to me. You know, why would it say for the whole world? But we're not talking about the whole world. We're only talking about, you know, the the limited people that God chose, right? Another thing that I always wrestled with in that regard, too, was, and, and I know that I am probably on the bounds of, of heresy here, and somebody will, will set me straight. Get, but get this my ruler was, out. Yes, but this was just always wrestled with in my mind, right, is, is with this limited atonement aspect, right, that, that the salvation, the grace and mercy of God wasn't available to everyone. It was only available to a few, right? To me, uh, again, I stress me, that to me makes Jesus less powerful than Adam because Adam's sin affected everyone, right? And then that position that, no, he only, you know, the, the grace only applies to the elect, then to me it's like, well, then it doesn't affect everyone. So Adam, what Adam's deed did, and he was just a man, what more widespread than what Jesus did as God. And that never set right with me either. <clears throat> so, so I always wrestled with that too, um, that limited atonement. And I know that it's limited in the sense too that not everyone is going to choose God. Some will choose uh, to not receive God's grace, but that gift is available to everyone, you know? Um, and I, I've, I've heard it said, too, that, you know, that the unwillingness to receive that grace 
is like sitting in a prison cell with the door wide open. You've been, de been mm. declared free and you refuse to, to leave that jail cell and live in freedom. Um, and so, so again, I do believe that Christ truly did die on the cross for all mankind. Yeah, it's available I, to all mankind. Uh, what you're saying here is this: there's a spectrum here from the very extreme fatalistic determinist position all the way to the so much so that God submits to my will and I, I determine whether God's going how he's going to respond. He actually doesn't know what's going to happen are the two extreme positions and you have various positions in the middle even on the calvinist side what you're talking about is more of a lighter version of calvinism where you're struggling with some of the points of calvinism there's a compatibilism is one way of, of phrasing it um, and so you have all of these various positions in between that ha and you see that there's usually an existential angst some place that they're wrestling with and you and it's a good way to examine how you feel or think about how these processes work because in it you'll find other nuggets i think that are important to learn about your faith but yeah is that your position or do, what, what is your position on the situation do we want to talk about that now or you know, I don't think my position matters. So I just oh, want to okay. I just well, want to see you. No, I'll, I'll, I'll share. I don't have a problem. But I just want to say, I don't think my position matters. I don't feel as though I want to sway somebody One way to think same. like me. I think you need to evaluate the scriptures for what the scriptures say. Um, <clears throat> but I will say, when I didn't grow up in a Christian home, so I didn't really know theology. Uh, when I gave my life to the Lord in high school, I went to Calvary Chapel so really, the only version I got was the Arminian position, you know, and I would say they even believe probably that you could lose your salvation and stuff sure. like that. Um, and uh, and so that was my theology. And then when I was introduced um, to the Calvinist position and made me wrestle and argue through that, I honestly came to the decision that I don't care. <laughs> you know, I, I don't I don't care don't for care, either Travis. position. Um, I think You're that okay with the, I with think the paradox. I think there's tension and there's a paradox that exists and I'm comfortable with that. I absolutely believe that God created us with free will to make a choice to follow him or not to receive his gift. Because in life, you can try you offer somebody a gift and they can say, no, yeah. I don't want that gift. You know, it happens all the time in restaurants when you say, I'll pick up the check. No, no, no. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, so again, I, um, I absolutely believe that God created us as, a, as free will beings because he is free and we are created in his image. I also believe that he handed mankind the authority, right, over creation mm -hmm. to some degree saying, hey, you guys take care of it. You rule over it. You take care, you know. So, so there was an aspect that God handed over some of the authority to mankind to name the animals and, and, and all that stuff. I absolutely believe God is sovereign, you know, and I don't think he loses his sovereign by giving mankind power that he created mankind to have. Um, I look at it like a franchisee, right? You know, like you're Chick-fil-A, right? You know, um, you give over a franchise to another owner and they they are owners in that franchise. But if they don't do what the you know, Chick-fil-A Corporation wants you to do, they will take that back from you and you will lose your franchise. So in one sense, Chick-fil-A is still sovereign, even though other people are operating the, the restaurants, the you know, um, as, as if it was their own. So I don't feel like you have to give up sovereignty to empower somebody. Hmm. And so that's kind of where I see yeah. all of that working out. And so I really just came... I don't think you're gonna. I'm gonna get to heaven and go. Okay, God, did I win or did they win? You know. What, well, I think we'll find out yeah. in heaven, right? And but, I don't think it really matters. And and there is yeah. a joke too. You know, from a, a Calvinist is like everybody comes to the Lord as an Arminian, and then once they get knowledge, they become Calvinists. That's what a Calvinist <laughs> would say. Yeah. So uh, okay. Well, then I'll, I'll kind of share uh, my position, and then we'll talk a little about because my position kind of comes from from the my reading of the Ephesians passage, but like, uh, to me, I started off growing up in a church that probably didn't really care about the issue all at all, at all until, you know, you get to about junior high, high school, and then everybody's like throws these ideas out and we're debating back and forth. But they were, what I was 
privilege to is even though probably the church was more Arminian than they knew than they knew or just open you know to free will not open free will but like um, that in the debate they kind of let you pick what side you feel comfortable with and so but as I grew older then it became like well did, does all mean all for me when God says I died for all I, he, he's not willing that any should perish do you is that the kind of any that's universal or is it the any in that particular group that isn't going to perish and then I started really looking at the Old Testament and the Old Testament's use of the phrase is like choice and predestination and election. And they're used very different to me in, in the Hebrew context. And that's really where I think Paul is borrowing from. He, he's using these phrases. And I think in the early church, they kind of abandoned a lot of the Jewish perspective on how to look at these things. And so Paul was very keen to them. And now we have a lot of these things. We have Second Temple literature. We have a lot of the early church writings and stuff that we can kind of compare to. But, and so what happened was, is, you know, some of these reformers didn't have some of that stuff when they tried to figure out what these scriptures were doing. And so for them, you know, some people have to go back to the Calvinist position when they go back to that section and that's how they see it. So now you have two history points. But from the idea of how do I how do I teach this when I'm talking to people? When Ephesians chapter and you mentioned this chapter one, verses three, it says, blessed be God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed all in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. So God's bestowing a blessing on everyone even as he chose in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. Um, and in love, he predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. So you have this I did, at the beginning of the world, some kind of choosing going on. The question becomes, how do you debate the choosing? And so for me, I, I like the example. And there are two examples. One is a baseball team. And, and if you're a Calvinist, if you're on team team Calvinist that's predestined to get to heaven, you're going to think that God goes out and handpicks the team. I picked this baseball player, and he's on first base. And then he puts them on the team, and now because they're on the team, they're predestined to have them. Now, if you're in the free will camp, you're going to say, God says, anyone want to play on this team because it's destined to win. It's going to win the World Series. Then anyone can join that team, but whoever remains on the team is predestined to win. So it's looking at it as a group, but there are individuals that can come in and out of the group. So it's just a matter of how you think of the choosing. And so if you think, no, God makes individual choices and puts the team together, or you think God says, no, no, the team is destined to win. Whoever chooses to be on the team is that. And that's why when I read passages like, okay, you who are in Christ are now in this blessing, because if you're in Christ, you and how do you get in Christ? You chose to believe in the faith and the promised seed that was to come, who is Jesus. Okay, so right there you have choosing to believe. So I tend to favor the side that says, God is saying, this team's going, is going to heaven. This is the team is going all the way to the World Series. You can choose to be on it or not. So that's the question that I usually bring. The, the real thing is in life, you're not going to know what that mechanism looks like. It's right. still God saying, hey, come be on a team. And so is he hand, you, you want to know what's in the mind of God. And I'm saying it looks the same from the outside looking at people coming in. And that's another tension that exists between the two camps yeah. is the, the, the choosing part, right? Um, and, and so, you know, you've got the Calvinist side that, that, is, that talks about predestination or predetermination. He, prede he didn't just predestinate, he, he predetermined it, you know, where the, um, where the Arminian position would say, well, yeah, God, God chose you and predestined you because he knew you would choose him. So, sort of, you know, yeah. so yeah. there's that one thing where, no, God predestined it. He chose you and you responded. The other side would say, no, he knew I was going to choose. So therefore, that's how we, I fall into that predestined count, which I would argue this, right? You can't separate the two, right? Well, there's always you know, an did, involvement did, of the spirit. Did God predestine and predetermine um, apart from any pre-knowledge, you know, or did he do that with the pre-knowledge of what you would decide. And I would say this, there is no way you can separate those two. God is all-knowing, right? Well, he's not all-knowing. He didn't know you were going to choose him when he predestined you, you know? So, so there is that tension yeah. there, and I'm not taking a side on that, but there's this tension there that how could God pre-choose without the pre-knowledge you know, and yeah. so so there is a tension and that exists. Both there. sides have answers for that. Also, the position I actually hold is called Molinism, which which says that God gave free will to man, knew all free will choices they would make, 
put them together and, and created the world that would bring about the outcome that he wanted to bring. So he knows things that didn't even happen. And so there's a passage in the Bible that literally says that David is asking, is Saul going to come kill us in this city? And, and, and he consults God, and God says, if, I, if we stay here? And God says, yeah, he will. And then he says, okay, well, we're leaving. And so Saul doesn't attack. So did God really know that? Yeah, he knows things that didn't even happen. He knows what you're going to do. The question is, did he cause you to do it, or did he allow you to do it, knowing that no matter what you do, his outcome is going to be satisfied? And that's the way I choose to look at it. I choose to look at it as God knew what you would do and gave you the free will. It's kind of like a chess game. I know the game better than you. You put your pieces on the board. You're free to move anywhere, but you're not going to win this game. And so that's kind of how I look at it. Um, And so for me, that's what wrestles the tension, that God is sovereign, and uh, God allows us to have free will, and but he has this plan that he has already invoked in the lives of people. The other thing is, when we're reading scriptures, try not to read whatever your presupposition is into the text. So like mm. when I was reading Pharaoh, like, oh, he hardens his heart, and there's, this is a, and I'm like, if God hardened his heart, like he came in and he made his heart hard, because this is a debate, um, did that mean anything to do with salvation, or what did it mean with him not choosing to free the Israelites? Right? Does that mean that later on when he did what God, when God hardened his heart and, he, and the Israelites were left, did God loosen his heart? We, we, don't, we don't know that. Was it just a hardening for not letting Israel go, or was it about salvation? And so I'd be careful because the text is saying in relation to him not letting go of Israel, God did a thing. And we do this to each other. Like, I can go up to someone and I know that they're triggered. Mm-hmm. So I can trigger them by saying certain words. Did they choose to do it? Absolutely. Did I cause them to do it? Yeah, I have some participation in that. So that's the tension that you see in the text, that there's this very complicated relationship where Pharaoh's choosing and then God's choosing. And I think God does have the right to sovereignly intervene temporarily to harden or strengthen someone's heart, because we can do that, but God must be able to do it even more so. But is it permanent? Once God does it once, does he never give you a chance again? I would be careful trying to limit God in that sense, because I think his plan is more complicated. And especially when it comes to who he's choosing to bring about the Messiah. So, right. and again, yeah. I just uh, you know I just want to reach out to that friend again and just let her know that I absolutely believe that God would not have um, suffered on the cross and gone through all that He went through uh, to not redeem you. And all you have to do is receive that gift, and you can choose to push away that gift. You can, and if, and, and it, and it doesn't matter how you feel, um, it matters what you do. What you do with right? the truth. You know, um, words don't matter uh, that much. Uh, because with, that, with words and no action behind it, words are meaningless. Um, and so feelings don't really matter either, as I shared in that story before. You can feel a way, it does not make it true. So, um, yeah, so I yeah. would say, really just seek God. Seek God, and, and he will be found by you. Yeah, and this will be my last words, too, because we're pretty much here at the end anyway. So I, I just want to say to you, I think go back and look at the evidence. I think if you go back, regardless of your confusions about free will or choice, uh, choosing, is God a God that would just arbitrarily curse you? Um, and if that's what you believe, uh, go back and read the Gospels and see the example of what Jesus did, and dying for all, the way he acted towards people, the way he offered himself in sacrifice for you, and see if that evidence doesn't outweigh the other evidence you see um, in, 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 in your mind and how you interpret Scripture. So I'm glad that we are able to settle the Calvinist-Arminian oh, yeah. debate yeah, and, yeah. and, and make that have more clear. Questions now. Um, so next week we will be doing end times. Is there a pre-tribulation yeah, oh rapture boy. of the church? Is the Antichrist going to rise in the middle of it? Or, or uh, no. are we going to go through the tribulation? So we will settle yeah. that debate next week. <laughs> I'm totally lying. Yeah. Um, but we might if you vote Greg off the island. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. So thank you, guys. And uh, we're done here, yeah, right? Yeah, God bless. All right. Boom, chakalaka. Boom, chakalaka.